So at the end of February, and it's a bit strange. It's it's kind of it's because of the way things have gone, and we've only seen each other for a couple, a few weeks. Uh, the year is still a little bit squeaky. It's still kind of brand new. It it just still kind of feels like the beginning of a fresh new year, and makes me think of that in life there are many beginnings and ends. I mean, there's there's with our life. Our birth, our life begins when we're born, it ends when we die. Now we have a spiritual life, we can have a new new birth with a baptism, our spiritual birth. It starts our path to the kingdom. It starts our commitment to God's way and relationship with God and Jesus. And also there is marriage, the beginning of the relationship of, as a husband and wife. Is going to university, they're starting courses, is starting habits, behaviors, trying to start and do good ways of doing things. They're easy to begin, but they're hard to continue. This is something I see and something, of course, that I myself work on. It's to begin something is easier than continuing to do it. It's easier to kind of say you're going to do something than to actually do it and continue to do it to to, to you know the once the the will meets the tarmac and you have to actually do it that takes a lot more effort and endurance is the key and we all need endurance in our run to the kingdom the runners that do the 100 meter sprint can run very fast and look very impressive but they'll have a lot of issues running a marathon it's not how fast or flashy we try to get to the kingdom. The important thing is that we get there. We don't know how long the path is to the kingdom. So we have to make sure that we are able to make the journey and that we can, we can continue on the journey. We don't know exactly when Christ will return, but we do know that we want to be there and be part of it. And uh, as in Matthew 25, we want to be like the five wise virgins. We want to keep our faith strong and we want to be prepared for Christ's return. We all have the opportunity for life eternal through the relationship that we have with God through baptism. And for this, well, we need to kind of be refining ourselves. We need to kind of know what to do and what not to do. And as part of this, it's, good, it's important to build good habits and to remove bad habits. Habits are things that we continue to do. And you'll know in your own lives that um, there's many useful and good habits we have and lots of bad and not so useful habits in various scales, for example continuing to do our Bible readings and continuing to meet to remember Christ's sacrifice for us, they're all good habits to have and they help us kind of re refresh in our mind and to kind of re refresh in our mind what we're here for and to um, help us to kind of see the journey and to learn from others who have been on that journey. And we're here today to remember Christ's life, his death, in his resurrection and the memorial meeting and the breaking of bread. And I always loved the, the fact that the men mentions how Christ's joy in doing that. Now this habit of us meeting together is a habit that strengthens us, reminds us of our purpose and exhorts us to keep on the path to the kingdom. It's why we're here today. Jesus says in Matthew 7, in verse 16, You will recognize them by their fruit. Grapes are not gathered from thorns or figs from thistles, are they? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. The, a good tree is not able to bear bad fruit, nor a bad tree to bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you'll, you will recognize them by their fruit. And we will be recognized by the fruit we produce. And we must endeavor to produce good fruit. 
And when we look at examples in the Bible, we see many examples whose faith in God was strong. They had steadfast faith. And we see from their example that they were producing good fruit. And we need to learn to endure and have steadfast faith like they did. And we have, Paul talks about this in, in Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 11. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for, being convinced of what we did not see. And then it continues on in Hebrews 11 on the many pe people of faith. I've always been impressed by the steadfast faith of Jeremiah and how he continued to preach for 48 years in the face of oppression and persecution. And we, we read in Jeremiah and the lamentations of much of the suffering and how he endured. And we hear how the God's word was like a fire in his belly and he couldn't stop. And that's what we want to kind of build into our lives. It, the fire of God's word is in our belly and it helps drive us forward. We've got Elijah who, though we felt like it was only him, God taught him that there were actually others around him who are also believing, which is also an example for us that we're all together and we all need to support and help each other as well. And then another example that I love is the, is the Apostle Paul who his life is spun around in a complete 180 by Christ coming into his life, teaching him there was a better way, a way of love. And through this way, he suffered much. But through this, he rejoiced that he could suffer for Christ. He counted this a privilege, which is an amazing thing. Oftentimes when we suffer, We'll just be unhappy about it and we'd be grumpy about that same fact. But Paul was so impressive in that he saw this as a privilege and saw this as a something he could use to help him to grow. These people, they're all examples for us and we have much to learn from their steadfast faith. There's a story about the race between the rabbit and the turtle. And the lesson there is consistency is the most important. We must keep strong and keep walking on the road to the kingdom, one step at a time. We have to be always moving forward. We can't bring other people into it in that our journey is between us and God and no one else. We can't blame anyone else for our mistakes. Now, of course, we can help each other and receive help, but in, in the end, it's about our choices we make. And like the many examples in Scripture, we need to repent of any mistakes we do and turn completely towards God. We saw David, who was a wonderful man, but he made the most horrific, horrific and horrible mistake. And when he saw and realized what he had done, when I guess you could say, instead of the fleshly David going around doing what he was doing to kind of sta stabilize the sin he had done, the, the spiritual mind awoke and, and, and looked up in horror at what he had done and then just absolutely repented and turned around because he realized that this wasn't him and this he had done something which was completely against him against what he believed and what he had been striving on his whole life. So it's easy for us to make mistakes. The important part is to follow the ex examples from Scripture whenever we make mistakes and ask for forgiveness and to turn completely towards God. Jesus also says in Matthew 7, enter through the narrow gate because the gate is wide and the way spacious that leads to the destruction. And there are many who enter through it, but the gate is narrow and the way is difficult that leads to life. And there are few that find it. And for things that are difficult, things that have sacrifice, have great reward. We must live the message we receive from the Bible. Now, in 
James, he says in James 1, 19, understand this, brothers and sisters, be each person be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. So put away all filth and evil excess and humbly welcome the message implanted within you, which is able to save your souls. We need to be continually cleansing ourselves from the dirt of the world. We need to wash ourselves with the water of the word. And I love those waterfall pictures, Josh. Thank you for that. And that's why we're here today. We're here to refresh our faith, to revisit what we got baptized for, to refuel our lamps, to, to build up our oil stockpiles, and then to do. James 1.22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. We must be doers in all our life and we must be showing God's love. Not only why we're here, it must be our life. Showing love is the ultimate form of preaching. It shows people that we want them to be our brothers and sisters. We treat them as we would like to be treated. And then that also builds bonds and we can slowly bring people in on the journey of love. Uh, James 1.22 in the NET version. But be sure you live out the message and do not merely listen to it and so deceive yourselves. And continuing, for if someone merely listens to the message and does not live it out, it's like someone who gazes at his own face in a mirror, for he gazes that at himself and goes out and immediately forgets what sort of person he was. But the one who peers into the perfect law of liberty and fixes his attention there and does not become a forgetful listener, but one who lives it out, he will be blessed in what he does. We can't forget. We need to remember who we truly are, that we are God's children. And throughout the week, we need to continue to show others the love and joy we share in Christ. We need to look to Christ and feel his love for us. Look to God and see God's love for us and that he gave his only begotten son. First uh, John 3, 23 says, Now this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he gave us the commandment. This is very simple. Well, very easy to say, let's put it that way. Believe and love one another, because if you think about it, loving one another is, is the best you can do to show what Christ is. Christ's death was loving us all. Loving one another involves Many actions, including preaching, because we want to also save other people. We want to show people how lovely Christ was. Faith involves believing and then showing that belief by showing God's love to others. Love is putting our belief into action. It's easy to just do the motions, but to really do and show love to all that is hard. And it may not be immediately obvious that we're progressing. Matthew, uh, Jesus says in the parable of the two sons, this is Mark, Matthew 21, 28. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first son, go work in the vineyard today. And the boy answered, I will not. But later he had a change of heart and he went. The father went to the other son and said the same thing. The boy answered, I will, sir, but did not go. Two sons. One obeyed, the other didn't. And it's the doing that counts, not the appearance. We have to make sure we continue to do what we have promised, to continue to do God's will. And the Pharisees are the ultimate example of this parable. Jesus said regarding them in Matthew 23, 25, Woe to you, experts in the law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside, 
they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup, so that the outside may become clean too. Woe to you exploits in the law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs that look beautiful on the outside, but inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. And in the same way, on the outside, you look righteous to people, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. The Pharisees were masters in appearing to do what's right. Appearing. And Jesus talked about this a lot in the Sermon of the Mount. Uh, Matthew 6 verse 1, be careful not to display your righteousness merely to be seen by people. Otherwise, you will have no reward with your reward with your Father in heaven. And it's very easy to do things to, 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 be, to people say, oh, that's wonderful, Daniel. Oh, that's great. And that's terrifying because as soon as you get people saying you did something great, you have to then worry, oh, no, am I then get, getting all arrogant or whatever? Am I not really paying attention to, to what I should be doing? And um, it, it's dangerous. You, you need to think, well, what you, you need to do what you can for God, not for yourself. And it's easy to have this appearance of righteousness. Actual righteousness takes effort. We can do it ourselves. It's so easy. Just turn up the things and not put our heart into it. It's easy to come on Sunday out of habit. Look forward to the time and look forward to the time we leave when we do our own things. What we need to do is to be more like Christ. And Paul tells us about that in Galatians 5, 22, for fruits of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh of its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also behave in accordance with the Spirit. We must focus on trying to show this type of character. When you think of baptisms, uh, baptism, it symbolizes the death of the old man of flesh and sin and the birth of the new man of the Spirit. The new man of the Spirit lives a spiritual life and not a fleshly life as before. We need to, to keep that fleshly person away. Galatians continues in, it says in verse 16, But I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh has desires that are opposed to the Spirit, and the Spirit has desires that are opposed to the flesh, for these are in opposition to each other. So you cannot do what you want. So, life as a baptized person is life to a higher calling. The way of the Spirit leads to enlightenment in God's ways. But, and as it says in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's about applying in ourselves the example of Christ, so that our fleshly selfish wants are controlled and a life of love is lived. It's mastering the human selfish fleshly ways and wants by applying God's ways. We want to model our life on the selflessness and love of our Master Christ. And we can see this in many ways when looking at at babies. The thing is that babies, when they're born, they're completely helpless. They need everyone to help them. The hard part is when they get old enough to do things for themselves, that's all they know. And they keep trying, I want, want, want. And um, the hard part is, tra is training children, encouraging children to do things for themselves, to then also help others, to share. It's in many ways we're actually teaching them the ways of the spirit, the ways of better behaviors, not just just for myself, to think of others, to show love, modeling our lives on the selfishness and love of our Master Christ. 
a, a far greater way. To do this, we must have patience and perseverance to continue in the, the ways of the fruits of the Spirit. We need to be constantly evaluating our performance, not others, but our performance. When we show a lack of patience or get angry, we need to realize and then redirect ourselves to follow, or realize that we, those actions are the ways of the flesh. Part of remembering Christ's sacrifice is also appraising our own sacrifices and performance and working to be like Christ our master. It's easy to begin something. It's a lot harder to continue on and keeping on the same path and not, not lowering our performance. And the problems with this world are because of the, because of the ways of the flesh. If we look at countries and places and actions and, and wherever we see bad things happening, it's all because of fleshly choices. We look at countries and whatnot that they actually do better. A lot of the things are because they're applying the ways of the spirit. Well, in limited ways. We have a look at, let's say, for example, the salesperson. His, his job is about building relationships and kind of teaching people that they're actually there to help them. So in some ways, they're kind of trying to show love. And then people we see in business, for example, that build relationships and, and connect with more people and have a, a, a better work experience because they, other people can help them, but it's not quite in the right purpose. When you, when you do these sorts of things fully and authentically as the ways of love, then you build yourself and others up to the true reward, which is God's kingdom. We have been called to a higher calling. Uh, it says in 1 John 4 verse 7, Dear friends, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been fathered by God and knows God. The person who does not love does not know God, for God is love. This is a unique thing. God is love, and we know everything good in life is because of love. And because God is love, then we can say all good in life is because of God. And then continuing in 1 John 4, by this, the love of God is revealed in us, that God sent his one and only son into the world so that we may live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And that's why we're here today. We're to remember our Lord and Master, Jesus the Christ. He died to provide a way for us to wash away our sins. We were baptized into him because we believed in what he did. We need to continue to look to Christ as our ultimate example. The more we show these attributes, and we've got to focus on all these, all those different attributes of the fruits of the Spirit, the closer to Christ we are. God began his relationship with us with the death and the resurrection of his son. John 3.16 For this is the way God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. We need to invest our time into this relationship. We need to read the word, reflect on it, to hear what God has to say, and communicate back to God of prayer. We need to pray. Pray to our Father in heaven. It needs to be a two-way relationship. Sooner wait will be over, and Christ will return. But until then, we need to be prepared. We need to be able to Endure until Christ returns. We are in this for the long haul. This life for many for many is for the short term prizes and short term, well, the for start is just their own life their own lifespan. But we are here wanting the long term prize, which is far better. 
when Paul says on this, 2 Timothy 4, 16, for I am already being poured out as an offering and the time for me to depart is at hand. I have competed well. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, a crown of righteousness is reserved for me. The Lord, the righteous judge, will reward it to me on that day. Not to me only, but to also to all who have set their affection on that appearing. And we are in this race. We're still in the race. We still have time. We have our examples. We are helping each other. And we're meeting every Sunday together to support each other to pray for ourselves and each other. And we're striving towards the kingdom. And we're fixing our eyes, like Jesus did, on the joy that is set before us, the joy of meeting Christ, the joy of, of hearing his voice when he welcomes us into the kingdom. And so I'll finish with Paul's words in Hebrews 12, 11. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, and we do. We must get rid of every weight and the sin that clings so closely and must run with endurance. The race set out for us. We need to see the, the path ahead of us. We need to keep, it, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set out for him, he endured the cross disregarding its shame and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. Thank you.